we ask is more of you. Let your fire fall. Give us hearts that burn for you. Then we, your people, will rise. Take up
from beginning of creation you have held me in your hands you have brought me to the seasons your love remains you're my pride and my Jesus, all I am is yours. Come and use me for your glory. Declare your praise. Cause in your name there's victory. And in your name I've been set free. Come saturate my life You're my pride and my possession Jesus, all I am is yours Come and use me for your glory To declare your praise
Your love has invaded my heart Consumed me and made me new How could I live but to live for you? Ooh, ooh. I'm leaving my past behind Freedom in Christ is mine Won't live for me, I only live for you Welcome to SIV Chaos Family Together Online Service. I'm Pastor Lindy, and if you are a regular here, welcome home! If you're new with us today, thank you for tuning in. It is so good to see so many of you here today. Do check out our live chat room and tell us where you're watching from. If you have not subscribed to our channel, click on our subscribe button so that you do not miss out any of our new content coming out. Our service is about to start. Let's get ready to encounter God together.
Calling all men. Come and listen to Pastor Daniel Ho on how we as men should serve with all the strength that we have as long as we have them. This session will happen on the 20th of June on Zoom. The details are as shown on your screen. See you there. Hey. Hey. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy. My name is Julia. And we are from the Children's Children Ministry. Ministry. Yay. Parents and children, do you know that every week we have our Children Ministry online services? That's right! Our services are for children aged 12 and below and we will premiere our services on Saturday at 5pm. 5pm! Say it one more time. 5pm! Where can you find our online services? You can find our online services on our social media or on the link below. So do join us for our weekly Children Ministry online services. We can't wait to see you there. So right now, we are signing off. Bye! Hey guys, my name is Bobo and he is Bibi and together we have some very special news to tell of you. Next week, Children Ministry is holding a Father's Day celebration service on the 20th of June, Saturday, 5pm, right here on YouTube at SIBKL. So Bibi, why don't you tell us what we're going to be doing? So Bobo, we're gonna do so much cool things on that day. You know, we're gonna have we're gonna have lesson, we're gonna have uh, praise and worship, and we're gonna have cool activities and games. And you know, I'll give you a little hint. It's gonna be something with these ties we're wearing right now. So stay tuned and check it out. So have a great week, guys. See you guys next week. Enjoy your service. Jesus said in Matthew eighteen verse nineteen. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. In line with this, SIBKL will be hosting a midnight prayer altar via Zoom, happening every Friday from 11pm to 2am. Let's gather online to pound the doors of heaven and seek the Lord for strength in these times of challenge and change. Workplace at the River is hosting weekly Thursday Biz Talks. Come join us as we have our lineup speakers sharing from their years of career experience. For further information, visit our website. See you online. During this season, we will be collecting our tithe and offering online. Here are the details. Stay connected on the latest happenings by following us on social media at SIBKL Church. Have a blessed service together. with all of you today so no matter where you're at you know whether in your room your living room why don't you join me you know get up on your feet or, or however you love to worship you know because where you are at you know invite the presence of God into that room you know fix your eyes on him turn your heart to him because he's so worthy of all our praise and all our worship today so you know why don't we set aside every distraction even as um, you are in this service and we are going to welcome the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so we we'll raise a hallelujah today Jesus thank you Lord I'll raise
praise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. Thought by now they'd fall 
But you have never failed me yet Waiting for a change to Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is our confidence 
that He will never fail us. God will not fail us. Wow, what an awesome time of worship. We want to continue our worship right now to pray for those that are sick amongst us. I know you are sitting in your living room or wherever you are. If you have anything that is unwell in your body or you are not feeling well physically today, um, can you just put your hands to that part of the body that is unwell today? And let me just pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up every single person on the screen right now that is unwell. Lord, we have a divine healer. We have our Father who wants us to be well. And so Lord Jesus, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill the living room that, or the bedroom that um, that person is sitting at right now in Jesus name we want to pray for your supernatural healing to come upon them right now in Jesus name and we want to declare that by your stripes they are healed in Jesus name I pray amen amen so right now if you are there just check on that part make sure and, and see if the healing has taken place because we believe healing would have taken place if it's not continue to pray into this atmosphere of healing we also have three names that is submitted to sibkl and we want to pray specifically for them right now so if you can join me to pray for these people lord jesus i just want to commit sw into your mighty hands she has a cyst in her ovary and she's having an operation soon lord we want to pray that that miracle, miraculous healing will take place in Jesus' name. You will heal SW, Lord, for CY as well. From his hepatitis C, in Jesus' name, we pray that CY will be healed of his hepatitis C. And for NL, NL who just got back from US and has was tested positive for COVID-19 in Jesus' name. Right now, Lord Jesus, we pray that your healing grace will be over him, that he will recover from um, and, and be back to normal, that COVID-19 will not have a hold over him in Jesus' name. We just want to declare that these three people, your healing power over them in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Right now, let's get ready to listen to the sermon. Hello everybody watching online, a good day and greetings to you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Wherever you are watching from and whatever time you are watching at, I want to say hello to you and I hope that you are well and your family is good. We have come into a new series for us at our church at this point of time. We just finished the study of the book of Ezra. Now we have come to the book of Nehemiah. Last week, we had an overview of the whole book of Nehemiah. Today, we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to go straight for it because I feel like a word is burning in me this afternoon. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. That's the entire chapter that we're going to be reading. Nehemiah chapter 1 says this, The words of Nehemiah son of Hekeliah in the month of Kislev in the 20th year while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love, with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins of we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. 
We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws gave, that you gave through your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them back to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and mighty hand. O Lord, you let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah ends chapter 1 by saying that he was a cupbearer to a king. But can I tell you, he was more than just that. He was a visionary. Today, the sermon of my title, or the title of my sermon, not the sermon of my title, is a visionary's prayer. A visionary's prayer. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come before you, to come in your presence, to hear your word. I pray that even as this word goes out today, let it not just be ears that will tickle our ears, words that tickle our ears, Lord, but let it be fire. Let it be revelation that will burn in our hearts. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this story is about, or this chapter starts off about this man called Nehemiah. Now Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem sometime in 444 BC. That's 13 years after Ezra shows up. Ezra you know, was focused on rebuilding the temple, but the book of Nehemiah tackles the topic of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. At this point of time, the temple had already been rebuilt for about 70 years, but the walls still remain in ruins. And Nehemiah, a man of vision, a great leader, a strategic leader, he managed to pull off a phenomenal feat and that is he completed the construction of the walls in a mere 52 days. And when we look at Nehemiah, the one thing that we can see that distinguishes him is that he is a man of vision. What do I mean by he is a man of vision? You see, we as people of God, we need to have vision for our lives. We need to have vision in all that we do. Now, vision is not just desire or even ambition vision is bigger than that vision is the inner conviction that produces passion in us now passion is not hype it's not wrong to be passionate about things we need to be passionate people but that has to be driven by our convictions and not just by our emotions and that's what vision is. And passion has to be consistent in order for it not to be hype. And I believe Nehemiah was a man of vision. Are you a person of vision today? You see, vision is something that you dream about when you are awake. It's something that you see when your eyes are closed. It, it grips you. It, it's almost like it's so compelling that you don't have a vision but rather the vision has you. I wonder whether you, wherever you're watching from right now, whether you have that sort of vision for your life, for everything that you do. And if you don't, I pray by the time you finish listening to this sermon and attending this online service, a new vision, a fresh fire will be birthed into you. You see, vision is so important. You gotta have it. In fact, there's this quote that goes this way. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs 29, 18. Without vision, the people perish. You need to have a vision in your life. The vision 
in your life and for your life will give you purpose. And that way, we can live a life that goes like this. A life that is not pushed by our problems, but led by our vision. And I want to believe that we, as a people of God, even when we go through unprecedented trying times, we will have the ability to see. Because in the natural, often in the natural, this is how things work. In the natural, you must see in order to, uh, you must believe in order to see. But I want to tell you, by the Spirit of God today, in the supernatural, when you believe, you will then see. That's vision. Vision for your life. And not just any sort of vision, but a godly vision. A godly vision. You know what a godly vision does? A godly vision restores and redeems with a goal to reach. That's what a godly vision is for. See, godly vision is not just selfish ambition or a desire to make ourselves rich, but it is to reach a generation, to reach a people, to reach our family, to reach society, reach the nation for the glory of God. Nehemiah, he had a vision when he saw the walls of Jerusalem in ruins he had a vision to rebuild them because he recognized a city without walls was vulnerable. So he needed to restore the walls. But not only that, a city without walls has lost its dignity. It remains, a, it, looks, it looks like it's lost its glory, its grandeur because it's now defenseless and it's also a reminder that this city was once plundered. So Nehemiah wanted to redeem the city by rebuilding the walls. We have a lot of things around us that look like it has been plundered and destroyed by the enemy and by evil forces. Will we be that people? Do you have a vision to restore and redeem your family, your businesses, your ministry, your generation, whatever that you have a heart for, whether it's a heart for the business industry, whether it's a heart for the communications industry, for healthcare, for fashion, for the arts, for music, if you have a vision to restore and redeem all those areas in order for it to be rich for God, praise God, there is a godly vision burning and birthing inside of you. And you see, a vision can come from an encounter with God or a vision can come for just a gradual realization. Not everybody has a, a open heaven moment. Some of us go through a gradual revelation and God is leading us into different areas. Or we could be like Nehemiah. Nehemiah, how this vision was birthed, he was just having a conversation with his brother Hanani. He was just having a chat with him and Hanani tells him, have you heard what happened to Jerusalem and the people of Israel living there? And as he heard those, that account, something within him began to burn. Something within him began to move him. And the Bible says he wept. He wept and he cried. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a kind of person that easily weeps or cries. I recently finished a, a very moving series on Netflix. It's called crash landing on you. Many, many touching scenes there. You know, I was moved, but I didn't cry. And I've got this rule, right? You know, as a man, you should only, you must cry in two events of your life. One is when your wife walks down the aisle to get married to you. And two, when your first child is born. Those are moments that you should cry. And I certainly did shed some tears. Uh, I have proof if you don't believe me. But when Nehemiah cried, he wasn't just crying out of being touched or being emotional, he was moved. He was moved. He was moved to the point where all kinds of feelings overwhelmed him. I don't know whether you have been moved to that point where you heard of an issue, you see a problem, you think of a circumstance that is just unjust, that is unreal, whether it's an issue of racism, an issue of poverty, an issue of injustice, an issue of 
brokenness, whatever it is, when you think about it, it just moves you to the point where you go, man, I must do something about this. I cannot sit still. I cannot sit back and not do something about this. That, my friend, is a vision. The type of vision that Nehemiah had. That type of vision. My friends, a vision is supposed to annoy you. It's supposed to frustrate you. It's supposed to keep you up. It is supposed to make you feel like, I don't know what to do. I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. A vision is meant to frustrate you because it's meant to move you. A heart that is not moved will see hands not set into motion. A heart needs to be moved. And when God puts something in our heart, or when God puts something in uh, your heart or give an idea or whatever it is, you know, the natural thing is to do this. We would plan, we would persist, and then we would pray in that order. We would plan first, right? If God gave us a dream, we would plan first. We would try to figure it out. We would try. It's kind of like Abraham. When Abraham, God gave him uh, a promise, what he did was he tried to bring about that promise in a human uh, way or a human understanding. So he slept with uh, one of his maidservants instead of actually conceiving with his wife, who at that point of time was supposed to not be of childbearing age anymore. Sometimes a godly vision or a dream will go against our logic. But that's the thing. We plan, we persist, and we pray when actually we should be praying first, and then only we plan, and then we persist. It goes against our natural instincts, but we should pray first. Because a lot of times when we come to God, what we do is we don't come to God for permission or direction. We come to Him for endorsement. But if we are to be people of vision, people who would see the hand of God on us and in us and move through us, we got to pray first. We got to make sure prayer is our priority. And it's not that we sit back and we do nothing. No, it's that we connect with God so that we can get direct revelation and direct divine insight from heaven. I'm reminded of the story in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, where in Genesis 8, it's the story of Noah. Now we know the story of Noah. Noah built an ark, he brought all the animals onto the ark along with his family, and then God wiped the earth out with a flood. Now, in Genesis 8, what happens is that the flood begins to recede, and now Noah is coming off the ark. But as he comes off the ark, you know what would have been a natural thing for him to, be, to have done? Is that he should have planned. Okay, now we're going to settle here. We're going to go to lands over there. We're going to bring the animals here and there. We're going to put them over here and all that. He could have planned, but he didn't plan first. He prayed. Genesis 8.20 said, Noah built an altar to the Lord. He prayed when he first came off the ark. As we come out of this pandemic, as you come out of a situation, as you step into what God has laid on your heart, will you first pray? Will we first pray? Will we first seek God? Will we not just have good ideas, but will we have God ideas? Will we not just Go by our own understanding, but may we be led by the Spirit of God. And that comes to the subject matter that I want to talk about today, a visionary's prayer. And we can see in Nehemiah chapter 1, this is the type of prayer that Nehemiah had. There are three elements to a visionary's prayer. The first thing is this, a visionary's prayer has reverence for God. I picked that up in Nehemiah 1 verse 5, where it says, Lord, the God of heaven, Nehemiah proclaims the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So the first thing that Nehemiah does in his prayer is he doesn't go to God and go, God, how could you let this happen to Israel? 
How could you let this happen to Jerusalem? How could you let the enemies destroy the walls? How could you let the people remain in disgrace? And all that kinds of, no, no, no. He comes to God and he acknowledges and affirms that God, you are awesome and you are great. And it's very easy for us to come into prayer and go, God, why do you allow this thing to happen? God, why is this thing happening? Why is this thing going that way? Why is my family like this? Why are the people around me like this? Why is my circumstance like this? My finance like this? My health like this? No, no, no. When you have a visionary, when you have a visionary's heart and you pray like a visionary, you first lift God up. You first lift God up because God ain't moved by frustration. He hears our frustration, but God is particularly moved by faith. God is moved by faith. And you see, the reason why we revere God in our prayer first and foremost is because what you magnify will occupy your life. What you magnify will occupy your life. If you come to God and you magnify your problems, what will happen is you will also start to feel overwhelmed. You will start to feel like, Oh no, you know, this is happening, that's around me, all the kind of stuff. And it's not that our problems don't matter, but it's when we come in prayer, we recognize that we step into the God who is the God of the turnaround, the God of the impossible, the God who death itself could not hold him down. This is the God, the God who delights in working the impossible a God who delights in giving good gifts to his children. So I want to say to you, friends, I want to say to you, family, don't tell God how big your mountains are. Go ahead and tell your mountains how big our God is. Oh, I feel like I'm preaching right now. Wherever you are, I want you to give God some praise right now, even if you're sitting on your couch. If you are watching online, light up the chat room right now. Give God some praise. He wants to move in your life today. Revere God. Tell Him He's awesome. And then watch your problems start to shrink back, start to become so small in the light of His glory. And let me tell you, what is the opposite of reverence? It's not necessarily um, being unreverent or irreverent, whatever word it is. It is actually treating something as common. That's what the opposite of Having reverence is is treating something as common. You know when you have something common in your life, you know, there are a lot of common things in our life, in our our household, right? We've got things like toothbrushes, uh, plates, forks, um, shoes, whatever it is. Now, all these things, while they are necessary, but we don't give special thought to them. And sometimes we treat even people closest to us with a bit of familiarity and treat as common. Right? We are so easy for us to esteem and honor those who are uh, with those that we're not close to, but our family members or our friends, sometimes we take them for granted. And if we're not careful, we can do that to God as well. Because we think that God's loving, God's power, God's loving, God's forgiving, and all that kind of stuff. And then we just kind of like relax and, and, and chill. But no, when we step into the presence of God, you are not just stepping into the presence of a friend, even though Jesus is your friend. You're not just stepping into the arms of your father, even though God is our loving father. You are stepping into the throne room of a king, of a mighty one, of our Lord. That you are, and when, when we do that, we should not treat it as common. When you're watching service online, When you are worshipping, you're not just singing along to words on the screen. No, you are declaring the praises and the promises of your God. When you listen to someone speak like this, you're not just hearing a guy mouth out some words. No, you are receiving manna from heaven. When you come into your prayer time with God, you are not just sending words up to a ceiling and having them bounce back at you. No, you are speaking to a living and breathing, and can I say powerful, God. That's what you are doing. So don't treat it as common, revere Him. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29 itself encourages us. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming 
fire. The second thing a visionary prayer has is it has a repentance of heart. A repentance of heart. I get this from verses 6 to 7 where Nehemiah says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. Now, repentance is, um, in, in the New Testament, it, we have a further understanding of it from the Greek word metaneo, where it means to change one's direction. And it's not just to feel bad or to feel sorry, but it's actually to change one's direction, one's orientation, one's alignment. Let me tell you this. Repentance or remorse without repentance leads to regret. But remorse with repentance leads to redemption. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 10 to 11 says this. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So repentance is not just feeling bad and then wanting to heap condemnation on us. No. With true repentance, it actually leads us to passion. It leads us to passion. Because you know, this is what repentance is. When we confess our sins, repent, when we confess our sins, what we are doing is we are unearthing, unearthing things that have been buried. And you know when things that are buried, it does not mean that light is now not powerful. But the thing is, when you bury something, it don't matter how bright light is, or it don't matter how powerful light is, light cannot reach things that are buried because it's concealed. So when we confess our sins, what we are doing is we are unearthing things out and we are allowing the light of God to shine on it. There's not going to be condemnation, but redemption and restoration. You see, when you have a vision, a godly vision from God, everything in life that you want to achieve through your vision is played by sin. The reason why certain industries are the way they are is because of sin. Every problem can be traced back to sin. The reason why there is racism, there is poverty, there's injustice, there's corruption, there is a lack of empathy, there is lack of generosity, whatever It is wayward children, broken families, broken marriages, all of these things. Whatever that division you have in you that is leading you to want to redeem is plagued by sin. So we need to have a repentant heart. We need to pray for these things and and repent on their behalf. Like how Nehemiah, he repented on the behalf of the people of Israel. But more than that, Nehemiah also repented of his own sin. Not just praying for other people, but he repented of his own sin. And for us, sometimes when we have a godly vision, the tendency is we now become self-reliant and self-sufficient. We have to repent of that as well. Because a God vision that is placed on your life needs to see a God provision. A God vision cannot come about on our own human effort, our own human strength or human brilliance? No. It has to be that God will bring it about. That way, God gets the glory. And if God gets the glory, I'm going to let God do the worrying. If God is going to take the credit, I'm going to make Him take the bill. I'm just going to be faithful and I'm just going to trust. And I want to not lean on my own strength or my understanding, but to lean on Him. Now get this. Repentance is not about beating ourselves up, but rather building a reliance on Him. Building up a reliance on God. That's what repentance is. The last thing that a visionary's prayer has is remembrance of God's instructions and promises. I get this in verse 8 and 9 where it says, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are faithful, I will scatter you among the nations. 
But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people at the furthest horizon, I will gather them there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. You know, as human beings, it's very easy and common for us to forget things, uh, especially when it comes to uh, people closest to us, right? You know, my wife is always telling me, uh, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I always tell her, why do you have to nag me so much? And she, you know, women, you know this, right? We men are terrible. And she would say, no matter how many times I tell you, you keep forgetting. Yeah. And that's what, that's what happens to us as people of God as well. It's kind of like sometimes we wonder, hey, uh, how should I be a good Christian? You know, what should I be? What should I do? How do I honor God? And how do I love God? And it's like God has already said it all through this. It's like, if you read it through this, there is no special revelation. There is no special insight that we need to get. We shouldn't be so busy looking for the concealed, but you know, we should get intentional about obeying the revealed. And here's the thing. When we pray and when we remember things, it's not because God forgets, it's that we need to remind ourselves of His ways. You see, let us not just seek the works of God, but forget the ways of God. Let's not do that. We need to seek both the ways of God, and then we will see the works of God in our lives. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, you know, it says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. I'm, of a, I'm a firm believer that when you follow the ways of God, you will flow into the will of God. So when we come in prayer, sometimes we should not be seeking what is your will. We should be asking God, what is your way? Tell me, lead me step by step. Step by step, because Matthew 7 verses 24 to 25, Jesus himself says this, whoever builds their life upon my words by putting my words into practice, they will build on a solid foundation. I don't know about you, but I don't want my life, my vision, my ministry, my family, my business, my finances. I don't want to be built on a shaky foundation. I want it to be on a firm foundation, and that is only the Word of God. And one other thing we need to remember is His promises, God's promises. When we come in prayer, we remember that God is a good God, that we remember the promise that He has spoken over us, the Word He has given us, the vision, the dream that He has given us, the Word, that the promises that are within this book. We remember all those things because... 2 Corinthians one twenty. we know this scripture, we quote it, right? It says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ and through Him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. When we come into prayer, when Nehemiah came into prayer, he didn't just appeal to the nature of God, he appealed to the promises of God. So that's why we need to know the word. We need to be close to Him so that we can allow His life, His promises to flow through us. And that way, when life tries to overwhelm us, we can overwhelm us with problems. We can overcome it with His promises. Friends, family, church, wherever you are at, I want to encourage you. I want to tell you when everything seems to fall when everything seems to be falling apart and everything may fall but the promises of God will stand oh I'm preaching good this day I need you to light up the chat room I need you to get up on your feet I need you to praise him I need you to say yes God your promises stand your promises stand everything may fall but your promises stand by the glory of God. And when you pray in that manner, remembering His ways, declaring His promises, you know, every night before I uh, put my little girl to bed, I always declare the promises of God over her, that the plans for her are good and not for evil, to give her hope 
and a future. That goodness and mercy will follow her the rest of the days. I even prophesy over her that she will be a good napper, she will be a good eater, and it has worked so far. You know, she naps at least three hours in the afternoon and she eats well. You know, she's eaten so well that we've stopped giving her milk, even though she's, you know, about a year and a half ish, now going to two years. Now, I'm not bragging, I'm not saying, hey, you know, look at me. I'm saying, look at God. Don't underestimate the power of prayer and the power of declaration over your life, over your situation, over your business, over your family, over the vision that God has for you. I'm speaking to visionaries today. And when I talk about a visionary, I'm not talking about people who are CEOs or people who want to be CEOs. I'm talking about people who have something from God that God has placed in you and you know it. People around you may not understand it. People around you may not see it, but you know it's there. Something from God. Something from God. To close, I will share with you this scripture, one of my favorite Psalms. And I, and because there's no, there's no copyright or there's no territory in the word of God. But you know what Psalm I hold on to even in the most troubled times? It's Psalm 84, 11, where it says this, The Lord... God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. No good thing does He withhold from those whose walk is blameless. We're going to worship and we're going to praise God as a response in a short while. And we're going to sing this song that we sang at the beginning of the service, but we're going to pick it up from this part where it says, Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your promise still stands. Come on, wherever you are, why don't you, if you have you been sitting down, why don't you stand up? If you have been lying down, why don't you sit up? Whatever you did, what, if you have been kind of like casually watching on, why don't you put away what you're doing for a moment? And let's declare this over our lives. Your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my promise. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, a God vision will see a God provision. And where God, where God guides, He will provide. What God has ordained, He will sustain. Wherever you are, whatever that you're going through, 
and whatever that God has placed in your heart, whether it's been there for a long time or whether it has, you feel like it's come along recently through a conversation with someone or even as God has revealed to you certain things here today. I want you to just commit that to the Lord. And even for those of you, if you are asking, what is, what is the vision that God has for me? What is, what is the vision that God wants me to carry? Whatever it is, can you just put your trust in Him? And I want to pray for you. But before I close, I want to uh, mention to you that this coming week, we will be continuing our 10 at 10 uh, on Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. I'll be, I'll be facilitating that and I believe it will be a time where God will birth visions, where God will give direction, God will give clarity. And I want you to tune in if you can, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday for 10 minutes and pray along with me. But, um, oh yeah, and after the service, we have an online prayer room. If you have any needs, if the message spoke to you or if you have any other uh, areas that you would like prayer from, you know, do stay back and join that prayer online uh, room. You can. There's a link that's going to be shown here and there's some more information even after the message here. Someone would reach out to you at the prayer room. But as we close, let's close in prayer and in faith, more importantly, that God who began a good work, He will see it to completion and that the word of God that has been preached today it shall not be returned void. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God, that your word is powerful, that your word is relevant, that your word rings true for all generations, for whatever stage of life that we are in. Lord, I pray that whatever that you have revealed and spoken over uh, to us over this message, you will seal it and you will cause it to take root in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those who have been discouraged. Lord, I pray they will find courage in Jesus' name. For those whose vision has been blurred, Lord, I pray that their vision will be restored in Jesus' name. Lord, for those whose vision the enemy has stolen or robbed, Lord, I pray that you give it back to them tenfold in Jesus' name. That we will rise up to be Nehemiahs, to restore and to redeem our generation through the unique giftings and the unique visions that you've given us through us and in us. Separate us now with your love. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. And we'll see you again soon. Some of you may have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible tells us that if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved and you will have eternal life. Today, if you want to receive Jesus, why don't you follow me in this prayer? Father God, I confess I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe you sent Jesus Christ, your Son, to die on the cross for my sins. He was buried and rose on the third day. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me and accepting me as your child. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, what an awesome word. If you need prayer, please scan this QR code or go to this link and it would lead you to our online ministry room. Our pastors and leaders would love to pray for you there. If you have just received Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the first time today, let us know who you are on this link and we would love to connect with you. And if you're new here with us, drop us a line as well. If you would like to give, please go to this link below as well. Thank you so much for joining us for service. You are so special to us. Have a blessed week ahead and we'll see you again soon. Bye!
seek your face. All we ask is more of you. Let your fire fall. Give us hearts that burn for you. Your people will rise, take our place in this land. No weapon formed against us shall prevail, Emmanuel.
Your love has invaded my heart Come to me and made me new How could I live but to live for you? Ooh, ooh. I'm leaving my past behind Freedom in Christ is mine Only live for me, I only live for you Unstoppable We are gonna change the world